Eric Stahl wires home the game-winning goal in his debut with the Habs. Carey Price looked to be favoring one of his legs. Brennan Gallagher, out long-term. There's a lot we want to cover, so guys, sit back, stay with us, and welcome to another beautiful episode of Shooting the Shit. As always, I am Landsman, I am your host, joined by, as always, my trusted sidekick, my partner in crime. What's going on? We got Z. What's hey, going on? Hey, Davey. How are you, buddy? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm good. I mean, I'm happy with the win, but... Uh... I know. It, 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 it was one of those games where a lot of good things happened, and you're excited as a Habs fan because they played well and the new addition fit in, but then you lost arguably your best player um, in Gallagher for week to week, and then now with the news this morning that um, Price is, is not going to travel with the team to Toronto, so... Uh, not sure what that's about. There are no details given, but yeah, <laughs> it's uh, it's um, it's a weird time right now in terms of <laughs> being excited and also being filled with dread. Absolutely, you know they say that what what like good can come like whatever good comes, bad is just around the corner. You know, I mean, like Eric Stahl was acquired on back in March, uh, late March. Well, yeah, we're early April now, late March, and you know. We were excited. We didn't know what's going to happen. He was in quarantine. He didn't practice with with the team until Sunday. He comes in the lineup. He's a little shaky at first. Takes a costly penalty. And we're all, a few skeptics out there were just saying like, oh, well, you know, why did we get him? Why did we go get an ageless guy like that? And then in the overtime, Yeah, I mean, it's funny because, listen, Stahl's 36 years old. He's got thousands of games under his belt. He's had success everywhere. Um, and I think a lot of people came in and expected him to fill that fourth line role. Um, and he kind of came in and took over the f- number one center role uh, in terms of he played with Drouin and Toffoli, who are arguably the best left and right wingers so far this year, right? So um, I think that caught a lot of fans sort of off guard at first because – as you know, Habs fans are a passionate group and, and uh, there's a subset that really protect the young players in terms of Suzuki and Kotkaniemi. Hey, I'm one of them. I, I, I love both those players. I think they're both going to be great NHLers. I want to see them have more responsibility. Certainly, they tr- seem to trust Suzuki, you would agree, more than Kotkaniemi, who they seem to isolate and maybe, you know, give, quote, not quote, unquote, I hate to say this, but quote, unquote, the less talented wingers t- tend to play with, with Kotkaniemi more often. Um, but it looked like, you know, last night, um, Stahl came in and, you know, it's his first game with the team. He hasn't, has that, hasn't had that many practices either, I believe, right? Cause he, Just the one on the Sunday. Just so one. I think if people expected him to come in and, 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 you know, score a hat trick and, you know, blend right in, they were probably setting themselves up for disappointment. There was always going to be an adjustment period. And by the way, that adjustment period is going to continue into the next few games. Um, but I thought overall he improved as the game went on. Um, and yeah, he, he is a step slow, but you can tell, man, the guy's smart in how he positions his body, how he protects the puck. He's a big guy. He, he's got a good shot. He's got good vision. I mean, obviously we're talking about a guy who basically scores between 20 and 30 goals a year for his whole career. I know he's, he's broken 40 a couple times. And yeah, he, he was bad in Buffalo this year, but everybody was bad in Buffalo this year. So I don't think it's a good, good basis to judge him on, but I thought he got better as the game went along. I don't know what you thought, but yeah, absolutely. He was a guy, it was a confidence builder as the game grew for him. You know, I mean, these are guys like we both said, he's practiced once with the team and he doesn't, he doesn't have previous experience playing with, I don't think anyone on that team, you know, like, I, I mean, I could be wrong, but like, to jump in the lineup and slotted in second line minutes right away. Uh, yeah, he had a good line to start with. It's true, but, you know. Yeah, it's it, a good it point. I don't think he has any overlap with any players from Minnesota and Carolina. He obviously played with a couple of those guys in Team Canada. Yeah, well, Team Canada is you know, a different a story, yes, but he never played yeah. with them in the terms of, like, on an NHL team for 82 games in a year. So, you know, for him – and also for, to play with a team, you know, like the Buffalo, who – Arguably the worst team. Well, they are the worst team, but like, you know, they, um, with a team that doesn't care anymore, they're just playing for playing. Whereas Montreal is playing and fighting for every game. 
is a different speed. It's a different mentality. There's a different mindset in the going in on in the minds of the Habs players, whereas the Sabers were just playing to finish their game. Absolutely. I mean, a two-zero lead. You know, granted, the Habs. <laughs> I think I read a stat before the 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 third period that the Habs were the worst team in terms of coming back from a, a two-period deficit. Um, but you know, credit to them, they didn't quit last night, and they had a, lost Gallagher at that point, um, which we'll touch on. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, he, we've talked about him numerous times. I feel like we jinxed him, man. <laughs> Maybe it was my fault. I am superstitious, but uh, you know what? Um, he, you know, he took another injury to the, another puck to the hand, another hand injury. I think it's a, officially a broken right thumb, which the good news is it's not his left hand, which is the one he injured a couple of times off Weber slap shot, uh, more recently. Um, but, you know, it was a big loss, and, and they looked discombobulated a little bit in the second period as Ducharme was trying to rotate wingers on onto the Deneau and Tatar line. Um, but credit to them, they, they dominated the third once they settled down and, and came back and won the game, which, you know, traditionally had not been a strength of theirs. A, winning in the third period is not a strength of theirs. And winning in overtime, that was their first overtime win. I, I know they won a shootout. So, yeah. so you know having some of these vets in there who, who won a last hurrah and having some of these young guys in there who are always playing hard, it might create a good mix of, of, of chemistry in the locker room here to kind of drive the Habs forward because you're right. They, they pretty much locked up a playoff spot at this point, but the seeding is going to be key between now and the end of the year in the North. And so they want to win games. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what you were saying. Like, you know, it's hard to replace one, one of the players who's one of the top scorers on the, on the team as well as the player who has the most heart on the team, it's a big void to fill. And the good thing, like you were saying, they were resilient. They did not give up. I mean, you were saying that's a, they're one of the, they are the worst team or the one of the worst teams? Yeah, I saw yeah, something like they had the worst uh, comeback record after two periods. It just makes me think of the opposite side of the spectrum. Whenever they have the two-goal lead, how bad are they of giving up to that two-goal lead in the third period? But, you know, they, they fought. They didn't give up. They really, they wanted it. I don't know. Like, it just seemed like they were rejuvenated and they're playing for maybe for Galley. Like, you know, but um, yeah. And then, you know, there was their 11th game going to overtime or a shootout. 11. They had won, they'd snap, finally snapped their streak the other day in Vancouver, against Vancouver, winning in a shootout. But that was their first time winning, like you said, in overtime. Yeah, and it was good. And it was nice to see Stahl get the winner. It was kind of a... Uh, a tricky kind of wrister um, you know Smith probably wants that one back uh, but you know what I thought the Habs actually played really well in overtime and in general against the Oilers I believe they're now four four and one against them uh, in the five games um, they do a, they've done a really good job of shutting down McDavid and Dreisaitl um, you know which like I think they play them four more times you're not going to shut them down for nine games but the fact that they've already shut them down for five out of that series, it's a testament, I think, to the team defense and the strategy that they've had against the Oilers uh, in the in the in the sort of uh, nine game series that they've been playing with them. So, you know, it was a, it was a full merit win for the Habs last night. I mean, even going down to zero, I thought they were the better team. Uh, I thought Price played well. Um, I thought Stahl eventually looked better as the game went on. I thought even. Um, you know, uh, and Yemi and Lekin and Byron in the first period set a tone, uh, you know, creating some chances. Uh, the only negative was they didn't seem to be able to get any uh, power play time. They had two power plays that were both negated very quickly with, with Habs penalties. So we didn't really get to see their penalty with uh, their power play, pardon me, with stall in the lineup. And it also kind of screwed up the minutes, I think. You know, Suzuki played less, Kutkin Yemi played less than usual. Um, and then obviously it looked like they trusted Dano to go up against McDavid, who plays, it seems like, half the game. Uh, so Dano played a lot. But um, I'm curious to see now what the lineup's going to look like. And I wonder what you think now that Gallagher's gone for a couple of weeks. Looks like Armia's still in COVID protocol. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks, so we would assume that he could be back soon. But it's probably not a safe thing to assume anything with COVID these days. So what do you think, Davey, is what's the lineup going to look like versus Toronto on Wednesday and then moving forward in your opinion? Well, one thing's for sure it's going to be different, but I mean, it's going to be a question of, you know, 
with all the line juggling that the, that Ducharme has been doing with the team this year, you know, is that do you bring up Frolik? Is Evans coming back? I think Evans is probably going to slot back in the lineup, which is a, probably given up, given the way he's been playing lately. So, like, because Jake Evans was, you know, pretty solid the last couple games before he was relegated to the taxi squad. Um, and then it's going to be a question of who plays center, who plays wing. You know, I mean, are you going to put someone on their off position? It's a tough call, man. I don't know. Like, I mean. Well, how do you replace Gallagher? I guess you don't. You can't. You can't. You don't. But I think what they're going to do, I have a feeling what they'll do. And, and you know, this caused a little bit of controversy on Twitter last night post game, which I, I like to spend some time with on Habs Twitter post game just to read people's reactions because it's funny. Yesterday was a good game for the Habs, a comeback win. They beat the Oilers, who they're battling with. They gained a point on them. And yet the main topic of conversation wasn't that Gallagher was hurt. And it wasn't necessarily that Price, you know, uh, looked uncomfortable after a collision in the first period or that Price played well, made, made a couple of really nice saves in that game. It was about Kutkin Yemi kind of being relegated to the fourth line role, uh, not getting enough minutes. And it appears that he was benched. Uh, and I had to go back and look at it because I didn't notice while the game was going on because I was, I was, you know, I was drinking whiskey and, and pacing. Yeah, and focus on the ice too. Games. <laughs> and focus uh, on the ice where the game is supposed to be watched. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, Kutkinemi, it looks like, didn't get into the game in the last uh, about – I think he took his last shift around the 10, 10 to 9th minute and then didn't see the ice again uh, down the stretch and in overtime. Um, so people were upset about that. Even though he played the third most minutes at five on five, and as we just mentioned, they didn't have a lot of power play time. Yeah. But one thing that did come up, and I'm curious to know what you think about it, is he did play a couple of shifts on the wing yesterday after Gallagher got hurt. And then Ducharme was asked about it in the postgame show and said, they're going to look at everything. He didn't commit to Kachinyemi being at center. He said, you know, he might play a couple of shifts there, a couple of shifts at center. I don't think they're going to move him from the center position, in, in my opinion. But I don't know. Do you even think it's a good idea to have Kachinyemi out on the wing? I don't think it would hurt. I mean, it obviously it's better to keep them in their natural position, but if he wants to see what's going to work, I, I give him all props. Let's do it. You know, like it's fine. As long as he doesn't make a co common theme of it, you know, I mean, play around the puzzle pieces. It's all, like, I go back to the puzzle pieces analogy because it's what works. It's what, what coaches do to see what chemistry works, what system works. I mean, I just, I don't want people to get irate and all up in uh, the business and I don't want, Kakanyemi, after one game of being on the wing to start like throwing his shit all over the place because I don't want it to be another Gal Galchenyuk situation. Yeah, that, that was a comparison. It's a good, it's a good one to bring up. But I, I just I don't think it's a similar situation. I think Kakanyemi is still young. Remember, he came in as an 18-year-old. He probably didn't have the same NHL-ready skills that Galchenyuk did, to be honest with you. But I think his trajectory is going to be a, obviously a much more consistent player than Galchenyuk eventually became. Um, but I don't know. I, I, think he'll, I think we'll see him at center. Even if they dabble with him at wing during a game, I don't think they'll start any game with him on the wing. Now, I mean, the question that you just brought up is they could bring Evans back into the lineup, slot him in between, you know, uh, let's say Lekkanen and uh, Byron and then play Kutkinyemi with, you know, Gallagher, uh, sorry, in Gallagher's spot, or maybe move Perry up there. Um, I don't think they'll do that. I, I think, if anything, Ar Armia's, again, I'm making an assumption here, but it, let's say Armia comes back within a week. Uh, I don't, you know, it'll, once Armia's back, Kutkinyemi goes back to center, and I think Evans is the odd man out again. Um, maybe before then they, they, they have a game or two with Kutkinyemi on the wing, and it might not be a bad idea if he's playing in the top six because he'll see more minutes um, and against better competition and, and you know, playing um, uh, against the better players and with better players really is the question, is the, is the key. But I think when you get Armia back, maybe, you know, Armia slots in for, for you know, uh, uh, Byron probably. You know, they move, they move, uh, uh, Byron was playing on the right wing, I think. And yeah. so they'll move, you know, Lekkanen on the left, Armia on the right with Kutkinyemi, the, 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 oh, the finish line, as we like to call it. Swami! <laughs> yeah, exactly. They haven't been great this year, but you know what? I think they actually have potential as a fourth line. 
I think they played as a third line in some cases. And I think as a fourth line, they probably work better. And then Byron, you know, Byron is not Gallagher. Uh, he doesn't forecheck like Gallagher. He's not going to stand in front of the net like Gallagher. But one thing he has is he's faster than Gallagher. And he can forecheck, maybe not as aggressively as Galley does, but he's pretty quick to get to the puck in the corner. And, I mean, he's the one who set up Tatar yesterday um, after they gained the zone. Um, he picked it off Nurse and then gave it to Tatar, who had that wicked uh, wrist. Sniper! Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, I'm, I could see that happening. The finish line reuniting. Byron, you know, playing up there with, you know, plus Byron is defensively responsible, and that's the line that they typically put out against the other team's best line. Maybe that's what's going to happen. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but there is the X factor, and you brought it up before we got on the show, of Caulfield. Yeah. I mean, Caulfield's supposed to make his debut with the Laval Rocket, uh, I think, later this week. I believe Thursday uh, – Friday for their game. You know, I mean, the thing is, is with Caulfield, uh, you know, it's a big question mark. We don't know what to expect from him. You know, we know that he's great. He was great with Wisconsin this year. We know that he's probably a lock, though some people would disagree, for the Hopi Baker. But we don't know what he's like at the AHL level. We don't know what he's going to be like at the NHL level. This is a kid who is also, he's 21 also, right? Yeah. He's, he's undersized, which, you know, it's the Habs model, go undersized. But he's got such finesse. It would be nice to see him in the lineup, but it would also be nice to see him start slow. Don't jump him too fast. But, you know... I don't know. I'm not speculating. I do like what you were saying about the act, act, um, idea of putting Byron up to the top line because I think his speed would definitely help them, you know, going down the, down the middle, on the wing, you know, finding the loose puck would be key. And also having that factor of having someone who could you can send out on a breakaway, you know? Uh, yeah, for sure. And, and let's not forget the point that we brought up, I think, last episode, which is Stahl could, Stahl could conceivably play with Suzuki – you know, and Suzuki and him would kind of really alternate center wing roles on the same line, whereas you'd assume Stahl would be taking face-offs, but Suzuki would be sort of the center role during the, 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 the playing on the ice in which he's the one who goes back to help the D, uh, goes deep into his own zone and moves the puck up the ice, and then that allows Stahl to sort of play the wing where maybe his lack of foot speed gets a little bit more um, hidden in terms of a, a – uh, you know, quote unquote, a negative trait. I, I don't, I don't know how how bad it is. I think he's just a guy. He just needs a little room to rev up. But um, it's interesting to to see uh, what Ducharme will do because you're right. He's got puzzle pieces. He's got to figure out. You know, and they removed the big piece by having Gallagher out, and now he's got to figure out a way to replace it. And um, and and you know, with Armia coming back, it'll help a little bit in on terms of their depth. Uh, you mentioned Froelich. There's Evans too who can come in. And then, yeah, Caulfield's the big thing. I agree with you. Uh, I mean, we talked about it yesterday when we, when we uh, um, did a guest spot on the, on the Red Light Hockey podcast. Um, and those guys, you know, who are not Habs fans, so it's interesting to see their perspective. They all sort of agreed to a T that, you know, the Caulfield should be sort of sent to Laval and not rushed up. Um, you know, although, although there was a good point made about being, you know, you're going to burn a year off his contract if you don't eventually bring him up. But I, I do believe Caulfield will, will be on the Habs this year. I do think, though, the, I, the plan is, and maybe more injuries might change this, but the plan is to give him, you know, four, five, six games in Laval, get used to the Habs system, um, you know, uh, get used to how they break out, their power play strategy and structure, and then have him come up to the big club and just sort of slide right into to the to the role and then really his only uh job will be to sort of just build the chemistry with whoever they end up slotting him with um that's my prediction for Caulfield I don't know if it'll happen but I just I don't think they they keep him down there I think he's too talented as a goal scorer and this is a team that needs goals you know what honestly I think uh I think you brought up a lot of good points I do want to thank the guys by the way uh there were three of them there were Chad Liam and Paul on the red light hockey pod you guys were awesome. So we wanted to thank you for inviting us. And we really, we really had fun. So hopefully we can all collaborate again, you know, shout out to you Absolutely. guys. Good dudes. We had a good time. Yeah. Good conversation too. Yeah. And it was fun because it was also a, a, a wide uh, mix. You know, we had a Habs fan, which was Liam. We had Chad, who was a Sharks fan. 
And then, of course, with, why not throw in a Bruins fan and Paul? You know, like it was just a good time of you know finding the good, the good and the bad. It was really yeah. we had a whole barrel of fun. Um, I gotta say, it's 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 always good to also talk a, uh, to a fan from the West Coast because it's it's something we don't really talk about, especially this year where every team is so regionally concentrated because of COVID. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, it, it was kind of, it's kind of nice to talk about what's happening in the other divisions a little bit, you know, so um, it was a great, good experience. I enjoyed yes, it. We really enjoyed it. So, but yes, on that note, I do agree. You know, Caulfield is one of those players that you just can't keep contained. You know, he, he's one of those weapons that <laughs> I don't want to use this in a bad way, but it sounds like he's a, like a rabid dog. You do not want to keep him contained in his cage too long because either he'll, you know, get tired and lose his energy, which is a good thing for the caged dog. But for when it's an offensive threat like Caulfield, you do not want to do that. Yeah, and I, I think they're going to use him. I agree with you. And I think they're going to use him pretty extensively in Laval, which is why I think it's a good idea to start him down there. He'll, first of all, he'll probably play on the top line right away, mm -hmm. uh, which oh, is 100%. not going to happen here, you know. No. Um, I think here what they'll do is they'll isolate him similar to what they do with Kotkaniemi. And then could kind of quote unquote unleash him on the power play, um, you know, and and maybe put him in in that trigger man spot. Uh, but again, it's there's going to be a learning curve. I, I mean, he, again, he was a 15th pick overall, and and I know a lot of people said he slid, he did slide in his draft year, but um, he wasn't going to be a top five pick anyway. This this wasn't a player who I think people you know are going to assume is going to come in and and pull a Connor McDavid, Austin Matthews. It's not it's not the guy. If you're expecting that. You will be disappointed. I think he's just a, a really, really, really good player who projects to be a, a, a solid top six winger with a knack for score, scoring goals and probably being a real weapon on the power play with that shot. And I think that's what we're going to see. Uh, there'll be some growing pains. But I think the Habs in the position they are right now could use that weapon because although their power play has been a lot better since Ducharme took over, um, it has kind of slowed down in the last couple of games. And I think with Gallagher being out and, you know, I just feel like Weber's been ineffective at that trigger man spot. Uh, I just think that Caulfield might add a, a new wrinkle. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's like yeah, karma in a way. It's like a good timing for, uh, for this to happen. Like, I mean, there's no good time for an injury. So Gally, we hope you get well soon because we do miss you already. And it's only, you haven't even missed a game yet, but to have Caulfield come up might be a good sign. Might be like, you know, a, a good taste for him to see what it's like to play in the lineup in the system under, like under Ducharme for the NHL level and under Bouchard in the AHL level. I just, you know, I don't want the, us to expect too, too much. You know, remember this is a kid who's never played at the level of AHL or NHL. So, cause I know, I mean, like I, I can go back to the situation with Ryan Paling. You know, he started his first game with the Habs, which was actually two years ago today, you know, and he got three goals. He got the shootout winner and everyone's like, oh my God, Ryan Palin is our new number one center. Yeah, some, some subset of Habs. Some people said that. Some people said also that he would be a top six. It didn't matter. They thought he was the saving grace for the Habs coming down into the future. So then he came into last season. And, um, yeah, he was nothing to write home about. He had a goal and an assist through 27 games. So then, you know, then they said, well, you know what? I think you should go to Laval. I think you should grow your game a bit. And he did. And now, <laughs> through 22 games in Laval, he's got 18 points. Almost yeah, he's been a game. good. He's, he's tied really with the lead, team lead. You know, he's, he's, you know, he's found his groove. And it's allowed him to mature. So I think they should Absolutely. do the same thing with Caulfield. I yeah, I think, I think they're very, very different players. I, I, I get what you're saying. I, I see Caulfield almost more as a Pacioretty type. Okay. A guy who scored a lot of goals in college. His role is really to be a trigger man on the wing. And, you know, I think Pacioretty played, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he played around 20 or 25 games, maybe, maybe 30 games in AHL before he got called up and then never really went back down. Um, I, I think the same thing will happen to Caulfield and it might be even expedited further because of injuries and this weird season of COVID um, uh, where we'll see him come up sooner. Um, I, I just don't see him spending that much time as a winger down there. A center it always needs more seasoning. Uh, yeah. That I agree with. And Paling certainly needed it because I think Paling, you know, people made such a big deal about his first game. It was 
a meaningless game at the end of the year that had no bearing on the playoffs and the Leafs were trying to rest and he played really well. Like, don't get me wrong. I mean, it was his first game in the NHL. He probably was really hyped up. He played great. And I think the following year, there were some unnecessary expectations on him as a result, but I never projected Paling to be anything more than a potentially really good third line center. And so I was a little bit weary and I think they had to play him on the wing last year and he had a concussion in the preseason. So he kind of went through some, through some shit last year, but I'm happy to see that he's kind of stabilized his game. And I do think he's a part of the future for the Habs. Um, uh, and, and so it'll be interesting to see what happens. I think Bouchard's done a great job down there this year. And, uh, and there's a lot of players who have developed and improved this year. Yeah. Well, I, <clears throat> for the record, I did check because you asked me to check. Inadvertently, you told me to check. So, yeah, in Patriot's <laughs> um, debut in the 08 and 09 season, he played 37 games with the then, then HL Hamilton Bulldogs before he was called at the Hats. You know, I mean, yeah, it's going to be uh, definitely an interesting uh, couple of, uh, couple weeks to show now. You know, I mean, the Habs have a very busy rest of the week this week. Yeah. You know, they're playing uh, back-to-back nights, one on the road, one at home. So that's going to be uh, – it's going to be exhausting for them, especially considering, you know, they're playing the Leafs on Wednesday, then they're playing the Jets back at home on yeah, Thursday. Games. Yeah, it's you a know. good point. I think they're playing like 15 games in less than 30 days, right? Yeah. So oh, yeah. That's like a really another good point about the lineup and the puzzles that you're talking about. He's yeah. got to rest guys here, you know. Uh, injuries might become more common, so, you know, scary yeah. to say. but I mean, the good thing is, I mean, it sounds silly to say, but the good thing is we do have too many forwards, you know. Usually in the past, I would say you have too many forwards. We have to work on moving someone out. We do still have to do that because of cap reasons. But for the fact of having a team with a good amount of offense and with enough offense on the back end, uh, sorry, not the back end, like defense, but like on the on the uh, yeah, like the bottom half, the of taxi our, squad, our, the bo- yeah, the bottom half, yeah, that our we bottom can six, roll yeah, for sure. people in. That's not ever a bad thing. So I mean, no. it's it's gonna be an interesting couple, uh, you know, a couple of games this week and then a couple of games uh, in the weeks to come. Yeah, and I mean, we, you know, the I think final point we should we should talk about is is so Price now is not traveling with the team to Toronto, so that means he's likely to miss the game against Winnipeg too, and maybe the game on Saturday as well. So. You know, Primo, I believe, was called up, and he's going to be traveling with the team. I imagine Allen uh, is going to get the net against the Leafs. Maybe we'll see Primo against the Jets. will be interesting. Um, now, Allen has actually, you know, if you look at it as a, as a full season, he's actually outplayed Price by, you know, many statistical sort of benchmarks. Uh, but as we've mentioned in previous podcasts, since March 1st, Price has been very good. Um, He's had amazing games. His save percentage is, I think, 920 in all situations. I think it's over 940, five on five. He's got a positive uh, goal saved above average, uh, you know, positive goals saved above expected. Um, you know, not, not like uh, eye-popping numbers, but they're on the positive side of the ledger, which he hasn't really been um, since the beginning of the year. So he was playing better, and it's a big loss, too, because he's a, he's a veteran. He, he earns respect. He's got respect in the locker room. And, you know, but I just hope he gets some rest. He gets uh, healed up. And I trust that um, Allen and Primo can hold the fort on the, between the pipes. Yeah, absolutely. That's something that the Habs have always had problems with in the past, you know, because Price has gone down with injuries over the past few years. And we know that very well as being the Habs fans. Right. But, you know, we've had a revolving door of backups that have never really proved good enough to be that backup. Right. Or, like, the backup role that would be there on the off chance there's back-to-back nights, you know, like with – Kincaid, Niami, you know, like, I'm just like, I, I can think of many more, but like, there's so many backups that really just didn't fit into the Habs system. Finally, the Habs management, Mark Bergevin and company went out and they got Jake Allen, which was a great move. I mean, right. a great move. And he has, like you said, statistically had great numbers this year. So I'm, I'm not too worried. I mean, for one, we've solidified a playoff spot. That's almost guaranteed. But, like, Allen has great numbers this year. And he is a proven guy who can take over the number one. That, that was our big worry at the beginning of the year. If ever Price is to go down with an injury, if ever he is to play a sour, uh, um, a downward spiral, would we have someone to take over the reins if needed? And Allen did that. I mean, I'm, I'm happy for Primo, too. You know, he's been almost lights out. He's got a record of 11-3 and three with a 2.07 goals against in uh, Laval. 
which doesn't really say much, but Laval has also got 17 wins through 22 games this year. Yeah, they're really good. And I think McKibben, too, has had has a good record and good numbers, too. I mean, Laval's been a powerhouse down there. And I, I agree with you. I'm actually excited to see what Primo can bring. I mean, it's he's already been sort of, you know, touted as a goalie of the future. And, you know, in a year or two, even though Price, I believe, still has four more years after this on his contract. But I think, you know, Primo's sort of the guy that they're looking to, to eventually take the – crease from price on the halves and you know it wouldn't be a bad thing to kind of get his feet wet here in some big games against teams they're battling for playoff positioning I mean it looks like the Leafs have built enough of a cushion that they're gonna f- take the first place in the division which I think a lot of people expected but the halves are definitely within um, distance of second place um, I think by point percentage they're, they're a smidge ahead of auto uh, of Edmonton and, and they trail Winnipeg. So the, the Winnipeg game is, is going to be actually the more important of the two if you assume that Toronto sort of leads too big and, and Montreal's not going to catch Toronto anyway. Uh, I would say the Winnipeg game is the one the Habs really want to win and win in regulation. Uh, unfortunately, it's the second game of the back-to-back, which is, is not favorable to teams. So um, they got to they gotta pick up points uh, yep. any, any which way they can here. So they got to put up a good showing against Toronto next uh, uh, tomorrow night. And... Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm hoping the goaltending is, is going to be a strength for the Habs here down the stretch because uh, yeah. they're going to need it. And they're going to need to cycle, guys. Same as, as the puzzle pieces that you're mentioning with the forwards, right? Yeah. Can't play the goalies too often either. So. Yeah, absolutely. You'll get them too tired and too exhausted, and their numbers will dip. I mean, yeah. No, I mean, the good thing is for Primo is it does give him some time to try and play the game at the Habs level. I mean, he's played two games already with them. He played two games with them last year. He's won one game, and but he still has a nine thirty one save percentage in those in the, within those two games. Yeah, you know, this is a was, former seventh round pick as a goalie. Like, he was like lights out in one of those games. He was really yes, good, I remember. yes, exactly. Yeah, and I mean he like <laughs> you know you alluded to Jake Evans being a seventh rounder. He's a seventh rounder too. But hey, you know. hey man, the, uh, one thing the Habs can't complain about or Habs fans or media is the Habs late round drafting in the last few years has been has been really really good. I mean it just. Uh, you know, Evans and Primo are two perfect examples. Seventh round picks are not supposed to become NHLers and they're not supposed to become potentially, I mean, Evans is not going to potentially be a star player. Primo has the potential. I mean, goaltending is voodoo. You can, goaltend, goaltenders come out of anywhere. So I guess I'm not surprised that if it's a, it's a goaltender who might be a star after being a seventh round pick. But um, certainly the Habs have guys on their team. You know, Lekkonen was, a, I think, a late round pick. Uh, you know, just guys that they've kind of nabbed over the years late in later rounds who have been key contributors, not stars. You know, this is not a Kucherov situation. I wish it was, <laughs> but, uh, but good solid NHL players. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would just allude to like a former, former Habs late round draft pick for a goalie that did turn out great and had a stellar career. Just he was drafted by the Habs played only a game with the Habs and he was a ninth round draft pick. Do you know who I'm talking about? No idea. Thomas Vokun. Yeah, oh Anyways. my god, I was going to say Thomas Vokun. Because I was like, I was like did, are there even nine rounds in the NHL? And then I was like, could it be Vokun? Yeah, because uh, Vokun did have a good career, you're right. He had a great career in Nashville, but he had a terrible career in Montreal. Yeah. Anyways, that was just uh, a little fun tip, a bit of trivia. But you know what, guys? I really like, um, I want to thank you guys again for tuning in with us for another lovely episode. You know, we're having fun. We are really just two guys chilling and talking about hockey we're passionate we love our game we love our team we could talk more about other teams don't worry don't worry we just like more talking about the Habs it's easier yeah I mean it's a good point we you know but it's just it's just the way the year's gone too the Habs are only playing six other teams so it's really concentrated on a few teams and you know I think as we go along here we'll start touching on other teams especially as the Habs uh you know next year hopefully things return somewhat to normal um, and also the playoffs are going to bring a chance to talk about other teams as well and other players. So we'll get there, you know, and we appreciate the support thus far. And, um, yeah, go Habs, go. Absolutely. You know, we will do some specials, obviously talking about the trade deadline too, because that's coming up next week. So without, with that being said, I want to thank you guys once again. Stay tuned for our next episode. It's going to come out later this week, maybe this weekend, maybe with a special guest. Um, yeah. So once again, guys, I want you to guys have a great day. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay awesome.